Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is true? I do. Okay, thank you. Good day. Thank you very much for allowing me to offer my thoughts to you today. My name's Anita Cameron. I am a 52-year-old with multiple disabilities, two of which are degenerative, and one which will take my life. I am testifying in opposition to the Medical Aid and Dying Act. I will not use the euphemism that's the name of this bill in my further testimony, but I will refer to it by exactly what it is, and as the New York Court of Appeals concluded, physician-assisted suicide. It is very important to be upfront, clear, and honest about what this is, couching it in pretty language and hiding the truth as disingenuous at best and dangerous at worst. As disabled people know very well, doctors often make mistakes about whether a person is terminal or not. In June 2009, while living in Washington State, my mother was determined to be in the final stages of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and placed in hospice. Two months later, I was told that her body had begun the process of dying. My mother wanted to go home to Colorado to die, so the arrangements were made. Funny thing happened, though. Once she got there, her health began to improve. Almost nine years later, she's still alive lives in her, her own home in the community, and is reasonably active. Last year, I was among scores of disability activists dragged out of congressional offices and hearing rooms and arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience in the fight to save health care. Our actions were detailed in a 20-minute segment of Rachel Maddow on M MSNBC and countless other media. That these actions are necessary shows the brutal reality of today's cost-cutting pressures in health care. So I'm here as the Director of Minority Outreach for Not Dead Yet, the National Disability Rights Organization opposed to physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia as deadly forms of discrimination against people with disabilities, whether terminally ill or not. I live in Rochester, New York, but I work with people of color in other marginalized communities around the nation. My primary reason for opposition to this bill and others like it is that disabled, black, indigenous, and people of color are at particular risk of being harmed by it. Our health care system is inherently racist. Studies show that blacks and people of color receive inferior medical treatment compared to whites. We are less likely to receive adequate treatment for heart conditions, diabetes, cancer, and chronic pain. The lives of people with disabilities are largely devalued by doctors and the society in general. The lives of blacks, indigenous, and people of color with disabilities are even more devalued due to racism and stereotypes about our communities. If in addition, ones from the LGBT community, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans community, as I am, that devaluation becomes exponential. As a black Latina, I can never wrap my head around the assisted suicide phenomenon. I thought it was some odd thing that privileged white people were into. And my thoughts were confirmed when I learned that the Pew Research Center recently found out that while 54% of whites supported assisted suicide, 65% of blacks and Latinos opposed it. Now, although assisted suicide requests an Oregon are lower among blacks and people of color. That doesn't mean that this won't change in more, more diverse areas, especially as healthcare support lessens. Groups like Compassion and Choices, formerly the Hemlock Society, are already marketing that idea to minority communities. Another reason for my opposition is that doctors will be the gay people keepers of people's lives and can decide for you about your quality of life. Under these bills, doctors are the ones who decide whether someone is eligible for assisted suicide. Another frightening thing that is told about this bill is that the definition of terminal is broader than one realizes. And this was borne out in an email conversation between Fabian Stahl of Sweden and Craig New, a research analyst with the Oregon Public Health Division. The Oregon law loses the same definition of terminal as the New York bill. 
Terminal disease is defined as an incurable and irreversible disease that has been medically confirmed and will, within reasonable medical judgment, in the opinion of the patient's attending physician and consulting physician, produce death within six months. So Mr. Stahl asked whether this rule is interpreted as without administration of life-sustaining treatment. Um, so the Oregon Public Health Division answered in December 2017, your interpretation is correct. The question is, should the disease be allowed to take its course absent further treatment? Is the patient likely to die within six months? Stahl further asked if the doctor suggests to an eligible patient a treatment that could possibly a prolong life, b transform a terminal disease into a chronic illness, or c even cure the disease. And if the patient doesn't give his or her consent to the proposed treatment, is she or he still eligible to take use of the act? If a patient with a chronic disease, for instance diabetes, by some reason decides to opt out from the life-sustaining medication or treatment and by doing so is likely to die within six months, thereby transferring the chronic disease to a terminal disease, does he or she then become eligible to take use of the act? And the Oregon response was, while this is not addressed specifically in the law, the answer in both cases is yes. Those patients will qualify. The law is best seen as a permissive law and states only that patients must have a terminal illness with six months or less to live. Doesn't compel patients to have exhausted treatment options first or to continue current treatment. So then Stahl then asked if the patient's health care provider or insurance company is not willing to pay for the proposed treatment, is the patient still eligible to take use of the act? The state response was patients suffering from any disease, not just those that typically qualify for the DWCA, may not be able to afford some treatments or medication and may choose not to pursue some treatments or take some medication for personal reasons. Patient's decision, the law does not compel them to do otherwise. If the patient does not receive treatment or medication for whatever reason and is left with a terminal illness, then she or he will not qualify. I think you could also argue that even if treatment or medication could actually cure the disease and the patient cannot pay for the treatment, then the disease remains incurable. To say that this is frightening for people with disabilities, communities of color, and poor people is an understatement. Under this proposed assisted suicide law, because of the climate we're living in, more, not fewer people, are going to fall prey to assisted suicide. Because of the racist, profit driven nature of our healthcare system and the tendency of doctors to devalue the lives of disabled people of color and the poor, assisted suicide has no place as an option in New York. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you.